This Week in Startups is brought to you by Captera, the leading free online resource to find the best software solutions. Visit captera.com slash twist for free today to find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. Airtable, the all-in-one collaboration platform that is flexible enough to keep up with the most creative, fast-moving teams. Visit airtable.com slash twist today to get $200 in free credits. And LinkedIn. To redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit and start your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. I invest in companies all year long. Some of them become huge. Some of them go away. All of them try hard. And one of the great ways for you as a founder to accelerate your growth and the growth of your company is to join one of the accelerators out there or incubators. But how do you pick one? Well, it's hard. Most of them are run by people who didn't succeed in their life. Most of them are a waste of time. You're going to get bad advice. But there's a couple of them that I personally think are very good. One of them that I think is just great is Urban X. And my friend Stonely Baptiste runs it. And he's brought five of the companies here today. You'll see the quality level of these companies tends to be very high. We'll see if he keeps up the performance. But you've uh, probably seen some of his companies on the podcast before. They're all focused on cities. And his Urban X uh, Accelerator is a partnership between BMW Mini and his fund, Urban.us. And we're going to see five of the companies. They'll pitch for three minutes. And I'll give them my candid feedback, almost as if it was an investor meeting. And I'm going to give them a little poking and prodding. Hey, how does this work? And you, as the audience, will see for companies coming out of an accelerator, what would an angel investor or a seed fund like ours launch? What would we ask these uh, founders? And then I'm going to ask them also what's their biggest challenge, and we'll try to workshop whatever their biggest challenge is. Well, each company will have seven minutes or so total, three to pitch, four to do some Q&A. We'll get through it pretty quickly, and then I'll pick my number one, two, and three company through the lens of my own investing. In other words, which one would I be most likely to take a second meeting with in order to figure out if I wanted to invest? First up is David Rodriguez. He is from foodforall.com. Welcome to the program, David. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Uh, three minutes on the clock. Tell me about your business. Cool. So hello, everyone. I'm David Rodriguez, CEO and co-founder of Food for All, a marketplace for surplus food. So unlike hotels and airlines, the food industry is still not using excess inventory to increase sales and generate demand. And this results in food waste, which not only is one of the main causes for greenhouse gases, but it also represents more than $2 billion of, uh, of losses every year. And at the restaurant level, our production is actually not food waste. It is wasted food. Fresh, prepared meals thrown away every day just because they were not sold. And with this problem, we saw both an opportunity and the need to, ch to, change, to change this into a completely new behavior. So that is why we created Food for All, a marketplace for surplus food, where restaurants can simply input their extra meals to our app and sell it to our users for at least 50% off. We started last year in Boston, and over the, over the summer, we moved to New York. We are now working with over 250 restaurants uh, in both cities. Um, this month, we reached to $385,000 in annual sales, and our sales are growing 18% month over month. Uh, on the user side, we have now more than 120,000 registered users all over the U.S. And the way it works is really straightforward. Users log in and see where food is available. They pay direct directly through the app, and then they just go to the restaurants and pick up their meals. Pickup window is only within the restaurant's working hours, so customers are getting the same quality of food and service. And for us, the easiest side of the network are our users. They are really excited about Food for All. They not only love the app, but they are willing to promote it. We have a net promoter score of more than 69 uh, and over 2,300 reviews now on the Apple Store. And for restaurants, Food for All is a seamless way to generate extra revenue, increase food traffic in slow hours, and create a new marketing and demand generation channel. Um, to, start, uh, to start simple, right now we're focusing on restaurants with pre-prepared food. So think about fast casuals, buffets, coffee shops, and grab and goes. Um, but our power is in creating user demand for surplus food. So we have the opportunity to go into supermarkets, packaged goods, and meal kits. Our competition, our two biggest competitors are located in Europe. Food for All is the company with the strongest concept here in the US. But we couldn't do it alone. We have a great team back in New York. We are three co-founders and six other amazing co-workers. We're really passionate to solve this problem. 
Uh, so over the next 12 months, we, um, we plan to get to 1,000 restaurants, get to new cities, and get to $2.5 million in gross revenue. So thank you so much for Food for All. Come and join us to our morning. All right. Well done. I'll give Food you a little lights. golf yeah. clap for that yeah. one. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I will say the deck looks beautiful. Thank you. And when the deck looks beautiful, it shows that you have an attention to detail. There's beautiful photography in here. Some of it you might have taken. Others might be stock images, uh, but the font usage and the slides were all great. Now, why do I bring that up? If you have a sloppy deck, you better have off-the-chart performance. Yep. You don't have off-the-chart performance. You have good, interesting, 300K a year in revenue. That means you're making about 30,000 a month in revenue, about 25. 32,000 right now. 32,000 a month right. in revenue. That's always with founders. They're going to correct you down to the penny. <laughs> $32,472. I got it, uh, which is great. Um, now, when you use that number, 32000 a month, Correct. is that how much food has been sold or is that your take, your percentage of the food that was sold? That is GMV, so gross, uh, gross revenue. Yeah, so that's the gross marketplace value, I think is what GMV Correct. stands for. So you get what percent of what's sold? We're taking 25% right now. Got it. So your actual revenue, your... Revenue is 25% of 32, which I believe would be 8,000. It's 7,200 right now. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, you're making 7,000. You got three employees on the team, four employees? Five right now. Five right now. So you're burning about 40K a month? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, really good. <laughs> I know what I'm doing here. I've seen this movie before. So you're losing, you're burning 33,000 a month correct. in order to build this business. But if you simply four x no you'd have to 5x what you're doing four or five x what you're doing you could very easily hit break even correct this business has been done before this wasn't your idea this is something that swept through europe over the last two years correct correct those businesses in europe which one is the leading business in europe um the lead business in terms of funding is karma karma and in terms of uh, number of restaurants is too good to go got it karma has received tens of millions in funding correct and do you have any idea what their GMV is right now or their revenue and what's their take rate? Um, I'm not so sure about the data right now. Okay. Uh, so this is another test. I'm okay. not asking you because I can't get the information. I can get it. When you're an entrepreneur, we like to, as investors, just push you a little bit and see if you know and you have competitive knowledge. So you failed the test on that one. You passed on getting to market. You passed on this. But you need to know your competitor is cold. Okay. And the reason is, if you know your competitor is cold, you know how to kill them. You know how to compete against them, right? So this is something where you could punch up your game. I'm always looking with that entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what skill can they learn. So it's like a basketball player. Some people might need to play better defense or Got hit it. more free throws, maybe work on their three, work on screens. In your case, know that competitive landscape cold because the credibility you will have by saying karma has 400 employees. Karma has 750 restaurants. Karma reported in their talk six months ago that they had reached a million dollars in sales. So know your competitors. Now, I'm not saying you should interview people who worked previously at your competitors for jobs and pump them for information, but I am telling you that's what people have done. Got it. Oh, wow. That seems pretty sinister, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Welcome to the real world. Okay, what's the biggest challenge in this? Oh, and just to recap mm -hmm. this business, my understanding of these businesses, Food for All, Karma, et cetera, is that they only sell for the last hour a business is open. That business says, I have eight slices of pizza left, just like I used to do when they were closing. I would just ask them, hey, I know you're closing. Can I get two slices for mm -hmm. one so I have something to eat tomorrow? I'm kind of broke. And they would always do it. Mm -hmm. Or I'd buy two, they'd give me one. Yeah, yeah. So they would always do that for me at Maria's Pizza in Brooklyn. Thank you, Maria's Pizza. Um, so this is the last hour people typically put their inventory up? That's correct. They put it up for half price? That's correct. Do they have to put it up for half price or they pick their price? So we discovered that half price is really what drives the traffic. Got it. So you advise them half price. That's correct. Do they do that out of the gate or do they uh, fight it a little bit? So it hasn't been a push uh, okay. all up to now just because everything is already prepared. The type yeah. of restaurant that we're targeting is restaurant that have food already prepared. I'll tell you what I love about this business. Instead of being a do-gooder, and saying, I'm going to create a nonprofit to go collect all the food and then give it to the homeless or something, which is noble. And people have done it for a long time. Correct. But there just aren't enough homeless people Correct. to 
feed with all the surplus food, correct? Correct. There's more surplus food than homeless people. So society is in some ways in good shape. But what there is, is there are people who maybe don't have as much money as they need and who are price conscious. And if they could save money, they could either have a better experience. That's correct. Have a better meal uh, or that they could normally not afford, or they could be buying food that I bought at double the price just an hour earlier um, and just eat an hour later. So it's fantastic for society that a free market system like this exists. And I think that's really the, the, the end goal that we have, like really dropping the prices for people to be able to get to access these quality meals. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people are, are used to, you know, like getting discounts on pizza and getting discounts on uh, pastries, but they are not used to get discounts on really healthy yeah. quality molds. So that's really the surprise access of what Food Pro is bringing. Uh, all right. That's why the users are really engaged and willing to promote the app. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for uh, Food for All. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. You need to find the perfect software to solve your problem at work. But how do you find it? Well, you go to Capterra because you need to find a solution fast to whatever your pressing issue is and you really want to know what all your options are. Well, with over 1 million reviews now in 700 specific categories of software, you can right now figure out if the software you already paid for is the right software or if you need to upgrade it or if you need to add something, right? And here, my guy Presh at launch is looking for new sales automation software. We need to make that sales process really efficient. Now with Captera, he goes through all the reviews. He sets a couple of filters, like the number of employees we're gonna use in the system. And he gets this nice side-by-side -side comparison of different products with the ratings for how easy they are to use. Because some software is really complicated, some is really easy. That's the value proposition, right? As well as obviously the value for money and the features and the functionality. Well, we picked and we were able to select the free trial option and we tested it out and we went with Pipedrive. It turns out Pipedrive solved some problems for us uh, and we, we got that because we used Captera. Captera is amazing. It's basically like Yelp, but for software. And I've always wanted a Zagat or a Yelp for software and it exists at Captera, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A.com slash twist. Go to Captera.com slash twist today and this is how much it costs. It's free. That doesn't cost you anything. You're going to find great tools and they save millions of people. They got to save them billions of hours of research and mistakes. Don't make a mistake. Get software selection simplified. That's it. Software selection simplified. Captera.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this episode. All right. Thanks to UrbanX for bringing some of their great founders from their sixth cohort here. Uh, thanks to BMW Mini for making my the first brand new car I ever bought. First car I ever bought was Mustang. Uh, 73 Grande, and uh, the second car I ever bought was like a 2003 or 4 Mini Cooper, and I loved it in Burgundy. Next up uh, is Pilot, P I L I T dot com. Jim Sullivan, you're the CEO, correct? Correct. Okay, tell us. Uh, you got three minutes on the clock. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, three, two, go. Thank you. Uh, we're solving a problem of uh, road safety. Um, approximately 800 deaths a year are occurring on the highway, and in addition to that, five incidents of non-fit fatalities, $9 billion in liability claims. This is a consequence of a decaying infrastructure, uh, knowing where people are on the highway during the construction zones. Um, the uh, technology that we bring to the market is a radio mesh network. We initially applied this network to uh, dis, uh, to lamps that are sequenced and flashing to help guide drivers through work zones. We then realized we could apply the same technology to sensors on the road to help uh, um, infrastructure manage infrastructure and assets. Uh, we currently are play, uh, deploying infrastructure sensors for crash cushions, attenuators. When these get struck on the hi struck on the highway, they can be damaged and non-functional, but no one knows about it. So now we've taken our mesh network. Not only are we applying it to traffic guidance in the work zone and for law enforcement, we're now applying it also for uh, notifying DOTs when infrastructure is struck. So people who aren't watching, it's those lights that we used to boost off of the wooden horses in Brooklyn. They have these big batteries in them. It's a big yellow light. Correct. Boost means steal. Just, I'm, <laughs> just so you know, Jim, we used to steal these for no reason other than to take them apart. But we were part of the problem because these were put up for a reason so people wouldn't hit a pothole that would kill them. You're Correct. saying 800 people die every year in the United States 
at construction zones. Correct. And it could be because some punk kid like myself 40 years ago decided to steal one of these. Uh, yeah, that's one one option. Or the, the other, battery dies. The battery or it dies. Gets or it gets knocked over by another car. It gets knocked over. We right. now can notify the DOT when these devices are non-functioning or they've been boosted. Or they've been boosted. Okay, okay. continue. Okay. Um, we can also add sensors to tell when bridges are vibrating. When uh, crash- Why is that important? Uh, the, infrastructure, the infrastructure was, most of our in- infrastructure on roads and bridges were built around the, the Second War, 10 years post-Second War. Civil engineers will tell you that they have about a 70-year lifespan, and it's 2020. 70 years Whoa. later, they're beginning to fall apart. And that's why Congress is, is talking of a $1 trillion infrastructure plan. They're crumbling. Mm. And so uh, th- we are providing sensors that will start to notify the DOT when a bridge is uh, starting to vibrate more than it and should. And vibration would indicate that it could be compromised. Exactly. Or on the road to be compromised. Exactly. Got it. Okay, exactly. Uh, the current traffic control deployment is about a $1 billion spend in the U.S., uh, with our new sensor technology where we are attached to the cloud and we can notify the DOT on our dashboard, that will expand that industry to about $5 billion. We currently have 60,000 units 60, on the highway. 000, wow. Yes. We have about two, uh, we sell uh, worldwide. We have a large customer base in Europe, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Korea, uh, of course, North America. We have uh, uh, 50, we have $2 million in revenue for this current year, and that's uh, scheduled, scheduled to double for next year. Uh, our gross margin on our hardware is 50%, and we're uh, anticipating a 65% margin when we move to our recurring revenue models, the sensors. You're going to rent the sensors as opposed to selling them? We'll sell the hardware at a lower cost, but then they will have a monthly subscription to attach to the cloud and use our, mm, our dashboard it. for okay, the DOTs. So you do hardware as a service, as we call exactly. it in the business. Exactly, exactly. Pass. Yes. We have uh, five states currently mandating our technology in the work zone. That is, they've codified our technology and written it into law. So when you go to a work zone in Pennsylvania or North Carolina or Massachusetts, you'll see sequential lamps flashing, much like a runway landing light, to help ah. guide traffic through through the, the sequential the lighting is done because they're smart. They're part of a mesh network. They Ex- have a little bit of intelligence in them, so they know that they're number two in the row. Exactly. They figure Perfect. that on on figure that out uh, automatically. You don't have to place them by they any. Figure it no- out automatically. That is correct. Through GPS or the distance from the previous one. Through our mesh. One? Through our mesh network. Which is just doing distance, right? It knows. Uh, uh, yes, uh, relative radio strength indicator, right. as well as uh, knowing who's filling which hole. We have uh, now 17 issue patents. We, we uh, were notified of our next uh, patent today, actually. Okay. So we have 17 issue patents. And um, the team that uh, has brought us here um, includes several engineers, uh, good salespeople. And, and look at this, Adam Sullivan and mm-hmm. Daniel Sullivan. So you, um, this is a family business, I take it. Are these gentlemen related to you in some way? These are your brothers? Uh, no, <laughs> they're my, my, my sons. However, oh, okay. I don't look at it as a family business. I look at it as low-cost labor. Okay, fantastic. Let's give him a big round of applause. Okay. Well done. All right. So I'll give it to you candidly. Okay. Um, I love the fact that people are looking at construction zones and those 800 deaths as something noble and important to save. Every life is critically important. Mm -hmm. There is nothing worse than us waking up every day thinking two people who did not need to die in any way. There was no rhyme or reason to it. They just randomly didn't come home. So on that, this business is already a success. Whether you succeed or fail, if you can just save one life, it's it's worth the effort you put into that. I think you know that because you got those two sons working with you. You obviously value family. So I, I thank you for that. Second, what a great idea. Everything is going to be a smart device. Why shouldn't the construction signs be smart? And who knows what that could unlock? Mm -hmm. And it unlocks the sequential, which makes them like landing lights. What a great idea. Was that the original idea? That was the original deployment. And then we moved to sensors and, in a business sense, the recurring revenue model. Got it. And a lot of this is because sensors Mm -hmm. have become essentially free. Mm -hmm. They're so low cost, you can put them in anything. Exactly. Those lights are bought by governments. I bet you those lights cost three or four hundred bucks for a government to buy, don't they? Uh, actually, a lot less. We well, worked hard. To, uh, the government buys them for about sixty dollars. Sixty dollars, and if they were on eBay, right, or on 
something like Amazon, that's probably a race to the bottom. They're probably 10 bucks or something. These are more industrial. They last a long time. Industrial, and they're smart. They have uh, the inherent radio. Well, what are the ones without the radio stuff in them? Uh, $15. 15 bucks. So they spend four times as much, but they're going to get this extra value. Correct. Which is a de minimis uh, cost change. The sensors in there are what? Is there Uh, accelerometers, temperature, as well as the radio sensitivity to understand how far they are away from other radios and the network, the the magic sauce, the secret sauce is in the, what we refer to as flocking behavior. It's Mm -hmm. a patent we have so that the lamps or the sensors can uh, talk to each other, send information up and down the roadway and attach the cloud with a single cellular modem. So we can have hundreds of sensors getting to our dashboard through a single cellular modem, which lowers the cost of deployment. So cellular the modems cost 50 bucks a month if you want to use the high LTE version, yeah. and the low sipping version is maybe 20 bucks a month, something uh, like that. Even less than that. So instead of putting that intelligence in every one, you put it in every 20th. Exactly. Or something like that. So you can deploy these super cheap. How long have these uh, been in market? And of the 60,000, how many are smart? Uh, 60,000. Okay. So they're all smart. How yes. long have you had them in market? Three years. Got it. So it took you three years to get to 2 million this year. Correct. And you plan on doubling next year. Correct. So that's where your uh, presentation breaks down. And it's the only place where it really breaks down is you're growing too slow. Now you're thinking, you're looking at me saying, who's this punk kid who stole these things? And then it's telling me doubling revenue is too slow. It's too slow for venture capitalists to get super interested. You got to double every six, seven months. Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is start thinking of a plan of how much revenue can you extract, how much value you can do, and how quickly you can get to market, right? And so doubling every year, if you set the goal to double every year, you'll probably hit that plus or minus 25%. But if you set it at triple and you hit it plus or minus 25% or even 50%, wow, now you got a real goal. So I, uh, my hope for you is that you try to go 3x year over year and build that plan. Coming into VCs with a 2x plan just shows slow growth. Remember, they want to get to $100 million in revenue in 7 to 10 years. That's what they're thinking about because that gives them the ability to 50x their money. So if you want to, and I assume you're here because you want to get the venture capital community's money behind this, mm-hmm. you got to be a little bit higher growth. There are three or four different ways to do that. One is to raise prices. Two is to change the pricing model, which it seems like you're doing. You're going to have this hardware as a service model. Uh, where they pay and they get the software. Be careful because now you're going to give them the ability to debate if they need the software or not. I would just make it one price for everything. Um, And then maybe it has a two-year subscription and in year three, then the subscription turns on if they need to or whatever. So there's a lot of different things there, but you got to have a little bit of a faster plan. Additionally, on the roadmap, I would start thinking about, okay, we found a business that we believe can double year over year. Okay, fine. So it's going to go from two in year three to four in year um, four or five. And maybe you can grow to eight. It's too slow. Is there something that having 600,000 of these out there and Moore's Law and the cost of things decelerating, 5G is coming, cameras are getting cheap. What if these things all had cameras in them? They, well, the new ones do. Okay, perfect. So now we're really cooking with oil. Right. If these things have cameras and one out of every five is taking video, and then you now, and they have maybe speed indicators, maybe these are also giving speeding tickets to people who are speeding in a construction zone, which is a huge ticket. Mm-hmm. So I want you to think a little more ambitiously here about revenue generation, because building a 10 or $20 million business means you disqualified yourself in Silicon Valley. So let's start thinking about, hey, what if you could give these for free to cities to put up and they had the speed cameras in them, you got a percentage of the revenue from those incremental. Because they say fines double or triple in construction zones. Um, Whatever they are, they're a lot. But I think they always have that side, don't they? They do, yeah. Yeah. Fines Fines, double. Fines double. Yeah. All right, well, let's find out who's speeding in the goddamn construction zone causing those 800 deaths and let's get their money. (laughs) All right? Okay. All right. It's really great. Uh, What a really interesting business. I just love that in entrepreneurship today, we're getting down to these very refined, you know, edge cases of where death occurs and we're going to try to eliminate it. I think it's very noble. And I think there's a, listen, I I don't want you all getting a bunch of tickets, but if you're don't going two, three times the speed in a construction zone, you you deserve the ticket. And Jim's going to give it to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Pi-lit.com. And we'll be back with more. Software should not dictate how you work. You should dictate how you work. 
That's where Airtable comes in. It's an all-in-one collaboration platform that is sweeping through Silicon Valley and tech startups. People are going crazy for this, including the investment community. I use it. Everybody's using it. Brian Alvey uses it. Everybody's crazy about Airtable. And Airtable is an ideal product for founders who are price sensitive, huh? And who are time poor. You don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of time, you want to use Airtable, and you want to create and operationalize as many processes inside of your startup. Founders can use Airtable for a wide variety of use cases. Product roadmaps, right? Maybe sprint planning, huh? Application tracking, fundraising, CRM, all the different investors you're using, and so much more. They have a template for everything. So instead of researching and buying and managing all these desperate, disparate, desperate, disparate, you know what I'm talking about, all the different ones. You don't need all these tools, just use Airtable, come on. Here's CMO Presh showing us how easy Airtable is to use by popping in, grabbing a template, and just using his data in Airtable. It integrates with all the apps you already use, like Slack, the G Suite, which is Google Docs, GitHub, LinkedIn, Dropbox. Customers of Airtable include Reddit, Slack, Box, WeWork, Zoom, Cole Hand, Shopify, BuzzFeed. In other words, every important company is using Airtable. Why? Because it saves you time, it saves you money, and what more do you need to know? So I want you to head over to Airtable.com slash twist and get $200 in free credits. I am not kidding you. That's not just a hundy from JCal. That's two hundy from JCal. Two beans, okay? Two hundred large boom in your pocket if you go to airtable.com slash twist right now at launch ballooner steezy tory free play and all of our founders are using it they're crazy about it okay thanks again to airtable for making an awesome product let's get back to this awesome episode hey everybody welcome back thanks to stonely for bringing urban x's latest crop of companies here and he did not disappoint next up caroline uh caroline caroline Caroline, ah, yeah, well magnifique. <laughs> uh, she is with Hubster. Dot DK, yes. Uh, which I think DK is has something to do with Korea, Denmark. No, Denmark. Okay, <laughs> thank you. There's North Korea. I thought this was like the Democratic Non-Republic of Korea. No, it's Denmark. Correct. It's Denmark. Um, which Copenhagen is exactly. the capital of? Uh, is that where you're from? I'm actually I'm French, but I live in Denmark. Copenhagen. You live in Denmark. <clears throat> we yeah. all hate you. We hate you. You know why? Because I don't want to sell Greenland to you? No. We're, we don't need Greenland. Because Denmark is the highest functioning democracy in the world. There is, is. an expression is. called getting to Denmark. Do you know what that, have you heard that before? I haven't heard that before. Then. So in the uh, elite geopolitical circles where they debate dysfunctional governments and functional governance, they say, we have to get to Denmark. And what they mean when they say we have to get to Denmark, getting to Denmark means that the people's um, will is reflected mm -hmm. by the government and the people who serve them. Mm -hmm. And in Denmark, you get that sense, do you not? Yep. You, do. you do. You do. And you go to Christiana and uh, you get the cookies. <laughs> yeah, you do too. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And I would tell you my You've Christi been there before? I've been to Christiana three or four times. I've been to Tivoli. Yes. I've been to uh, Noma a couple times. Yeah, not the new Noma. Mm -hmm. I love Denmark. Yeah, I get the Schmorborg great... there. At Ida Davidson. You ever been to Ida Davidson and get the Schmorberg? I haven't, actually. You know what the Schmorberg is, right? Yeah, Schmorberg. Schmorberg. <laughs> Schmorberg. Yeah. It is the brown bread. Yeah, it is. You put the butter on it, mm -hmm. put a little fish on there, some dill. Delish. Mm -hmm. Many love great it. things in Denmark. I love That's Denmark. True. I gotta go back to Denmark. Mm -hmm. We have to get to Denmark. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have three minutes. Three, two, go. So, hi, everybody. I'm a co-founder at Hubster, and uh, Hubster brings play to public and shared spaces. So basically, if you're like me, you're always glued to your phone, and globally, one in four adults is not active enough. And according to the WHO, engaging in play every day has direct health benefits for people's mental and physical health. Real estate developers and cities have expanded investments in amenities for sports and recreation in parks and waterfronts, etc. But there is a problem. We have great publicly accessible spaces and more new infrastructure, but people cannot play or train spontaneously. I give you an example. A basketball court is not enough. You need a ball. That's where Herbster comes in. Herbster makes it easy to add play and training gear to any shared space, whether public or private. We are the last mile for sports and recreation, and we connect people, run playful activities outdoors. People use the Herbster app to see the different available activities on a map. These activities are, for example, 
basketball, volleyball, TRX, ping pong, and similar to renting an electric scooter, when standing in front of a hub, people use their phone to unlock the shared box and they can borrow the objects they need. The app can also be used to connect with other potential players. We use patent pending technologies to keep track of the object and who uses them. And it's easy to add our hubs to a new location because we don't need power or Wi-Fi. Once the hubs are installed, customers download the app and then they can rent equipment either on a monthly subscription basis or a pay-per-use basis. We are already operating in Copenhagen and in Paris and people love the solution. Now, most active users are using the hubs twice a week. We have LOIs for 200 hubs in Europe and after four months in the US, we're very happy to announce partnerships with some high profile recreational destination in New York and hopefully we have good announcements in the West Coast soon. There is a potential for at least 500,000 locations in 225 major cities globally, leading to annual recurring revenue of $2 billion. Revenue is a mix of owned and franchise hub. We expect owned hubs to generate about $540 in MRR per hub, and franchise hubs generate a one-time fee of $3,500 and ongoing license revenue of $160 a month. Hmm. We will expand our network into 10 American cities and 10 European cities in 2020. Today, the main alternative to our solution is for end users to bring their own equipment. The other solution, the other competition is to staff location to supervise rental, but only the best funded location can afford this model. Our team is equipped to build a global company. And today we're looking for partners to help us install 1000 hubs in 20 cities and support 500,000 games, 500,000 players in 2020. So okay. hopefully you'll want to join this journey. Fantastic. Well done. We'll give him a big round of applause. So you said uh, $500 per unit that you manage. Mm -hmm. So you are going to manage the network mm -hmm. of these as opposed to selling it to other people to do their own thing. Exactly. But we just get a cut. Yeah. And you said $500 a month is what you think the revenue will be. Mm -hmm. So if I rounded that up to 600 that would be $20 a day. Per location, per day. So basically, the way it works is that we expect to have, we want to have one hub for 1,000 inhabitants. Got it. Out of this 1,000 inhabitants, we expect 100 of them to be our users. Out of this 100, we have 15 per per use mm. per hub and 30 memberships per hub. Got it. Okay, so you're going to put the hub together and the hubs cost 100 bucks, 200 bucks to build? It's actually more expensive now uh, because we have smaller amounts. So right now it's one thousand nine hundred. Oh wow, nineteen hundred dollars to build a hub. And we can. Have so they're the all cost. bespoke. Right now. Mm, they're beautiful. Uh, we have a company called Colony K O L O N I that is doing the same idea in America mm -hmm. uh, that we invested in in our accelerator. Okay. So many people have the same idea at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the sharing economy uh, makes this possible. And I see ping pong is one. Mm -hmm. Basketball is one. So we have 15 different solutions right huh. now to have a, a large appeal to a broad segment of the population. Mm -hmm. So we have right. yeah, basketball, volleyball, soccer, ping pong, boat right. share, and different type of uh, board games. Great. Oh, and board games as well. Yes. Fantastic. Um, and so you think direct to consumer is the way to go or selling it to people is the way to go in franchising? What is your thought on that? Because you're doing both. That yes. to me is always a recipe for disaster. So basically, right now, we're mostly focusing on B2B clients, mm -hmm. and our main clients are clients such as university campuses, Got it. real estate developers, retailers, this type of factors. And we Got start it. doing some lobby towards cities, but it's much more long run. So there's two ways to do this. You could either have your own service, build your customer base, or you could piggyback and just sell the yes. units to other people and charge them a monthly fee. You're choosing the B2B model. So we're choosing the B2B models, but one thing that we have also is that we have actually several distributors huh. in different parts of the, of the world reaching out to us mm. because this whole area of recreation and um, and uh, and sports, uh, mm. not sports, but recreation mostly in cities, is really red ocean. So they see us blue as ocean. blue ocean. Sorry, no so they're seeing us as um, as a key differentiator. Yeah, in there. In We're the hoping business. that blue ocean does not turn red. No, sorry. <laughs> it's quite all right, but it, just having seen the Great Barrier Reef, about half of it was red and half of it was blue, was pretty disturbing. It was actually kind of sad. Um, and uh, is is your team responsible for doing the engineering of the hardware, or is that something out of China that already exists? No, we've done so. You're building the hardware. We have 
so we have designed the hub, which has won several design awards. And it, we is, have, it is beautiful. I think it's one of the highlights. Is, the ping pong ones particularly is beautiful. Thank you. And yeah. this is actually the great thing about it is that because it's beautiful, we have also the different object manufacturers giving us the object for free because they take that as a way to sponsor the business. Ah, got it. So you put all your effort into making that hub. You do it bespoke in Denmark. You make it there out of wood yep. or? So right now, so we have a factory working oh. for us. Uh, it's actually a safe deposit manufacturer, so which makes the hubs really got impossible a, wait, to wait, vandalize. a safe deposit? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. That's why it's so expensive. Exactly. 1900. And you're doing it in a socialist country, which <laughs> means people are getting paid $72 an hour exactly. minimum. Exactly. But you're going to ship it to China and eventually make it there so you can make it with people making a dollar an hour. Correct? So you get it. We can definitely have the cost. How does that feel as being somebody from Denmark, mm-hmm. a socialist country, and you have to spend $1,900 building a locker and then you realize as an entrepreneur this is unsustainable? And that you need to move it somewhere in the world that's communist. Well, we're actually looking at different options in the U.S. to produce oh, it in okay. the U.S. And we have pretty good yeah. options right now. What do you think it will drop down to if you do it in the U.S.? Mm, we can drop it down to 900. 900? Yes. What do you think in China it would cost to make? Yeah, probably down to 300. Wow. So you could build three for one. Is it a moral or ethical thing as being somebody who lives in Denmark when you think about this decision? Or are you a capitalist who just thinks, I'm going to send this work to the the cheapest labor in the world and, and have my business grow fluidly. This is a, I guess, a, it's, a decision-making process mm-hmm, that you have to is. go through, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So we haven't we haven't made the final decision yet, ah. but I have to say, I think also in terms of, uh, of branding for mm. the company and because of the segments we're addressing right now, right. it actually is quite important, I think, to be consequent with what we're saying. Mm. And the fact, for example, that we only work with the best designed object that we put in the hubs mm. definitely has a strong appeal to our clients that mm. also makes them ambassadors. And I think also these things are also quite important in order to grow the so brand. So in America, having it be built in America or in mm. Denmark, having it be it built could've. in Denmark mm. is on brand for you. That helps it the decision, you think? I mean, again, we haven't made the final decision, but I okay. think it can help the brand, yes, awesome. to build it in Denmark. And in the I US. bring it up not to put you on the spot, but because you happen to be from Denmark, which is, I think, for Americans, we look at it as like, wow, mm-hmm. this is like the social democracy that some people in this country perceive would be great. It's hard to run a company there, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's hard to run a company in Denmark? Yeah. Well, that's the reason why we're here. Definitely, ah. there is more money here, and it's easier to scale and to go faster in the U.S. Right. than it is in, uh, in Denmark. Definitely. It, but there are also issues around employing people and how you deploy capital there, correct? Mm-hmm. You're totally right. Yeah, it costs a lot more money. It does. And people take a year off to make it does. babies. Yes. Is, that, uh, is that a reason why people don't start companies there or leave? Is that... No, actually, you're going to see both ways because it's also, I mean, you have big incentive to start companies in, uh, in Denmark because you have lots of public funding. Right. So, which is the reason why actually we've been bootstrapping for two years because we've got su- subsidies. Ah, the government subsidized mm-hmm. you. So, in a way, there is an upside, and the upside of public health care exactly is that you don't have to provide the health care exactly. You just provide a salary exactly. Um, so that is something we're wondering about here in America. Should we just mm-hmm. have it be a public option where mm-hmm. the health care is provided by the public? Do you think? Do you want to have my, op- my opinion on that? Yeah. I mean, I'm European, so obviously yeah. I think it should come from the States. Do you think States, it's yeah. unconscionable and embarrassing for us that we don't have it as a human right like you do? <laughs> do you want my honest answer? Yes. I do think so. It's embarrassing. I think it it's embarrassing, yeah. Yeah. That we country that has as much money as we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's embarrassing. But yeah. we can make these lockers for 900. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just saying. So... <laughs> I mean, that is it's really interesting in a microcosm mm-hmm. like this. This is the it first is. time I've had a discussion mm-hmm. with a founder who's faced with this issue. In a microcosm, if you look, the $1,900 in a socialist country to build something, 900 mm-hmm. in our quasi, you know, our rampant, rabid entrepreneurial one. And then in China, where like humans are, you know, less cared for, is mm-hmm. even cheaper, mm-hmm. right? It's really mm-hmm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. And, we're, and we it all is. live in this global economy. Mm-hmm. We have to totally right. make it work. Mm-hmm. All right, listen, continued question. success. I think it's a tremendous idea, which is why I invested in the, uh, your competitor. And so in this situation, uh, don't send me any more information. No. <laughs> and I wish you luck. And I Thank hope you. that this becomes an Uber Lyft-like situation where there's two winners. And I hope that I'm on the Uber team, but if I'm on the Lyft team this time, that'll be okay. And you could be the Uber and you could win. It's only this Thanks. time you win. Last time I won, this time you win. It's okay. We'll both win. It's a duopoly. All right. 
Great job. Let's give Thank her a big you. round of applause. Nicely done, Caroline. All right, you guys know LinkedIn. You're on LinkedIn all day. Me too. We love it. There's over 600 million members. What you might not know is that 62 million business decision makers visit there. That's right. And 71% of people use information from LinkedIn to make informed business decisions. All of your future customers are hanging out on LinkedIn right now. When you advertise on LinkedIn, you find both these customers and you build long-term relationships with them. Well, LinkedIn ads drive the results you care about most, and LinkedIn's powerful targeting helps you reach the right audience, right down to their job title, right down to the company name and the industry and more. Here is my marketing manager, Maureen, creating an open office hours lead gen campaign. Open office hours is how I meet the next generations of companies that I want to invest in. And here she is. She's looking for founders, co-founders. She sets a budget, 25 bucks a day. She puts the ad up. She uploads the text and boom, she says, apply now. Here's the form. And look at that in minutes. We have a campaign up and running and we get founders to apply to come ask me questions at open office hours, which become episodes of this very podcast. And that's how we get our funnel going. We use LinkedIn to find great founders that we can invest in. I want to give you a hundred dollars. What? Yep, that's right. I'm going to give you a hundred dollars right now in LinkedIn ad credits. And I'm going to let you launch your first campaign by going directly to linkedin.com slash this week in startups, no spaces, no dashes. LinkedIn.com, you know that, slash This Week in Startups. If you type out This Week in Startups, you get $100. It's that simple. Terms and conditions, of course, apply because we're giving you a hundy, but you're going to love it. LinkedIn marketing works. Go get the hundy. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, we're cooking with oil, and our next startup is literally working with fire, so that is appropriate. Patrick O'Connor is here. He's the CEO of 3AM Innovations, which is three, the number three, AM Innovations.com. Three minutes on the clock, three, two, go. So I'm Patrick, co-founder of 3AM, and we created a network of devices, software, and people designed to protect those who protect us. So when I was a firefighter arriving at the scene, I would first check in with my commander, who would write my name down on a whiteboard. Uh, then uh, not many people realize that firefighters still track themselves with dog tags. Uh, and when we lost two of our own to on-scene confusion, and as you can see, there was about 200 deaths uh, in the fire service last 10 years, it was time for a change. So we created a system of rugged, wearable devices that mesh with each other to create their own network. So our proprietary hardware interprets the firefighters' movements on the edge and then broadcasts their 3D position anywhere within a structure, even nine floors below ground. So our devices do not need internet to operate, but we progressively enhance them through LTE, Bluetooth, ultra wideband, and uh, GPS. So our adaptive software listens to these broadcasts and ensures that every firefighter can be visually tracked and more informed decisions can be made. So we're initially targeting the volunteer organizations, which represent 73% of the U.S. firefighters. Now, fire departments have budgets for fire safety equipment, but we're working with insurance companies to extend discounts so that even the smallest fire department can offer I mean, can, uh, afford everything that we have to offer. So our product is not just a fire product. It's a first responder product. So the, we are well positioned to support environmental disasters, which in the last 10 years have risen by 300%, as well as wildfires, which have grown by 400%, and active shooter events, which have increased by 158%. And while we're focused on firefighters for a market entry point, our devices can track any first responder, and tracking first responders is a $29 billion global opportunity. So mature companies have been trying for years to track first responders with GPS, but GPS is just not reliable indoors. Startup companies have been developing solutions that require beacons and cell towers to operate, but none of them are practical, none of them are focused on the fire service, and none of them are commercialized. So our devices, they could track location without GPS, and we connect to each other to ensure that the commanders are automatically informed. We're the first and the only to do this from the ground up to the cloud, and we've patented our approach. We are in trials with five U.S. fire districts and multiple government entities, including the Department of Homeland Security and the uh, DOD. We have seven letters of intent that represent $4 million of ARR with a line of sight to $20 million. And we have a non-exclusive distribution agreement with W.S. Darley, who sells uh, fire safety equipment into 90 countries worldwide and has sales of $400 million last year. And so we're dedicated to securing the safety of a million firefighters worldwide. And we're raising our seed round to unlock the next 20 million in ARR. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Big round of applause. 
My brother's a firefighter. Um, he's faced this situation uh, tragically. Uh, you know, his second, um, the second fire he ever reported to duty on was 9-11. Oh, uh, and so OG is right. And my grandfather, a firefighter, got arrested his soul at McCabe. And uh, yeah, it's needed. I This is the second uh, mesh network discussion mm -hmm. we've mm -hmm. uh, heard here. And so this mesh networking technology is off the shelf now, and it works brilliantly. Well, well yes and no. So our device didn't exist until we made it. We no, I know, but the mesh networking yeah, mesh core networking. technology yes, is correct. built by other parties, mm -hmm. and you put it into your device and build the software around yes, it, correct? Yes, Just like GPS or Wi-Fi is a chip. Yes. We're, what we're is that called? What is that mesh network? Who provides that technology today? So it's ultra-wideband. So that's what we're, we're utilizing. Okay. And ultra-wideband means what? So ultra-wideband is basically it's a range of frequencies that uh, go span over a very wide band, and it. so it's more of like a brute force tactic to get it through different structures. So if you have concrete rebarb, it's going to be very hard to get a signal through it. Right. Ultra wideband just sends it across a wide spectrum. And if once some get through, some don't. So. Got it. So if you want to have a brute force for a short distance mm -hmm. through thick walls, mm -hmm. ultra wideband. Yes. And As opposed to 4G or 5G, which is... A narrower yeah. band. Yeah, so that's not going to actually penetrate. So the lower you go in the spectrum, the more penetration you get, but the lower data you could send. Got so it. with our devices, we do what's called edge computing. So we don't need internet or anything. Every second it's saying, this is my longitude, my longitude, latitude, and height. So it's 100 bytes of data. Mm. So we're able to hop that with each unit. So Got my it. unit could talk to you, and I can't talk to anyone else, but you could talk to him. We could pass between you, and you packetize it and send my data with yours. And they all have 4G in them anyway. Yes. So if they do happen to have mm -hmm. the last person, excuse me, the last person in still is on the first floor, they get the person on the second floor, third floor, fourth floor down. All that data is eventually making its way over the exactly. 4G network mm -hmm. to back to the truck. Yes, and uh, ultimately to their alarm office as well. So right. if you're completely off grid, let's say you're in a wildfire situation where you have no connection, you could be completely off grid and still be able to represent your team on this on our laptop Got or it. tablet. But if you have an LT connection, you could stream it to your alarm office and they could see everything that's going on as right. well. So when you're in the field, if you happen to have and every one of them has a 4G connection. So if just mm -hmm. one person happens to get yes. on, you're good. Yep. If nobody gets on and you're in the field in a fire, you're basically, it's good for you to know where everybody mm -hmm. is, but nobody else knows where the team is. No, Well, yes. So each unit, if you're completely cut off, because we're not going to be that naive and say that we could connect everyone at all times, right. we could store up to eight hours of data on each unit. So in mm. that case, it turns into more of a black box situation. Right, where you but can we find least, out what happened. Exactly, but then we could yeah. put in uh, standard operating procedures to at least mitigate that moving forward. Um, so feedback uh, from uh, my brother, Lieutenant in Ladder 28, the Harlem Hilton, as they call it. Uh, this is the best thing he's ever seen since the AirPak. And so uh, and he's been involved in a number of fatal uh, firefighters was a frantic start. Mm -hmm. i to put you in touch with my brother, Josh, and Please. maybe the NY, um, FDNY might be able to use this. The packs are not that expensive to build. It's a $100, $200 it, bomb. So for ours, it's actually 350 at the moment, but we have, okay. that's at low scale at the moment. 350 to kind of have bespoke ones. You're making mm -hmm. hundreds at a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the bomb, for people who don't know, build of materials. Yes. That could go down to, if you build 10,000 of them, what? So we'll, we'll look to actually kind of keep that static because we always want to keep ingrading, uh, upgrading rather ah. our technology. And if we keep that static, then we could always have the Got best it. technology go out to them because it is a life safety product. What, so that's one of the nice things. This isn't like Easy Pass where, mm -hmm. you know, 100 million cars in the United States are going to have it eventually and every dollar matters. Mm -hmm. This is every life matters. Yes. So every dollar at this stage does not. Mm -hmm. and you're charging $50 a month, yeah, so which means you break even in month seven or eight. Yes. Yeah, so we're a HASS model. So we're yeah. hardware as a service. And the reason why we're doing that is we progressively replace. So for the uh, RMA, we're going to know everything that experience, the, the unit's experience. RMA in the field. is? Uh, return to merchandise. Got it. And so when the units are in the field, we don't need internet. But when they return to the fire hall, everyone has Wi-Fi. Got at it. that pump, uh, that part, we'll do a data dump. And we see the heat load, the G-forces, anything ah. that they experience. And we're going to write to them and say, look, we just overnight a new package to you when it gets there. It gotcha. takes serial number XYZ out of service. Right. And it was, uh, since it's a life safety product, we ensure that it works in that 1% of the time it needs to work. Now, 
I always think it's very interesting, and we had this with Pilot, of like, what's next? Mm -hmm. I assume that this thing could have a panic button on it, a strobe light. It could have a camera. It could have mm -hmm. a microphone. Yes. There's other things, an alarm, because they do have alarms on- The pass alarm, yes. The pass alarm. Yeah, P-A-S-S. That's somewhere else on the person's body. It's, it's located right here. You just press that when you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yep. But yours could also have something similar. It could have a strobe exactly. light. It could have cameras. Mm -hmm. So if they're wearing it, it could also be, if you wore it you know, up top, mm -hmm. it could be like uh, the cameras that police wear now. Yes, exactly. Uh, so what's on the roadmap? What's really interesting that you think could take this even to the next level? Well, the easy next step will be integrating with biometrics, so like Fitbit, some uh, of that. So we have Bluetooth. Rate. Yep. And so we have Bluetooth already on our device. So just integrating with a Fitbit or a Samsung Watch or something like that. So don't reinvent the wheel. They already have it. Just get the APIs for that. Um, and then uh, we have other uh, just integrating exactly what you said with video. Mm -hmm. So uh, getting cameras up on the actual fire trucks and have that stream into our service so then the remote office can get a better picture as well so they could Got actually it. provide more information. So there's a lot that we could do that's on, on the roadmap. Listen, this is incredible. I wish you continued success with it. And uh, gosh, really important work. So thank you for doing thank it. I'll you. put you in touch with my brother, Josh. And thank All you right. for his service as well. Oh, and thank you for yours. Yeah, thank okay. Uh, big round of applause. And we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Our fifth company, and we put them in random order, so don't read into that, is Evolve Energy. Michael Lee is the CEO. Are you Michael Lee? Yes, that's correct. All right, good. No interlopers here. Three, two, go. Great. So if there's one thing you want to remember about Evolve Energy is that we can save our residential customers up to 50% on their electricity costs and cut their carbon emissions by 70%. And the best part is they don't have to do anything different from what they're doing today. So high level, what we're looking at is in Texas, where we just launched a few weeks ago, the average residential homeowner overpays for the electricity that they use to the tune of about $1,000 to $1,500 a year. Uh, total bill is between two to $3,000, and we think 1000 of that we can cut out. Um, and the way that is, is that right now when people buy electricity, is that they pay at the residential level the same price for electricity every single day every single hour, regardless of what's actually happening on the grid. And so what that means is that there are actually a lot of dynamics, power prices change. Oftentimes what we're seeing is that markets that have a lot of renewable energy, such as Texas, which has a lot of wind on the Western side, when wind is available, we have an abundance and power prices go negative sometimes. And then as soon as that wind stops, we hit a scarcity event. And then maybe a half hour later, we get abundance again when the wind kicks back in. And so we're seeing that in local markets as we have more and more renewable energy, this is creating a lot of volatility. And so that's driving up uh, fixed rate retail prices. So that's where we come in. We sell electricity to residential customers at the wholesale power price. Think of us as like Costco, but for electricity. And that alone saves about $1,000 for our customers. Even if they don't change any of their behavior, that alone can save them a ton of money. But what we do is where we like to focus on is the AI and IoT side. We like to predict how and when people will use energy and then integrate into their smart devices. A lot of them are say Nest Ecobee thermostats that they already have as they go through their upgrade cycles for washer dryers, appliances. These are all IoT enabled, electric vehicles, hot water heaters. These are all becoming electrified and controllable. And so what we're doing is we interconnect into all these different devices through their APIs and optimize the exact intervals that people use electricity on. Um, a little bit of a, an example here. So Sarah, she spends about $3,000 a year on electricity. What we do is we kind of pre-cool her house in the morning when things, are, when things are cheap. We see a power price spike, so we pause exactly how and when she's using electricity, but she doesn't feel it because we pre-cooled it. And then later on, we kind of maintain that normal temperature that she likes. So we, through this event, we saved her 50%. She didn't do any work. Uh, we get to a great outcome for her and she starts trusting us more and more. Uh, so we have about 2,000 customers on our waitlist in Texas where we just launched earlier. We've been able to acquire these waitlisted customers, about $20 a customer. Uh, we have a highly differentiated product in that market. And what we see is that the people who this is resonating for either already have connected devices or a connected house, uh, care about the environment, or are millennials and are spending about 5 to 10% of their income on electricity, right? Because if you're making, wow. call it $50,000 a year, net of taxes, 
if you're spending a couple thousand dollars, that's that's a pretty sizable portion of your of your after tax income. So, like I said, Texas is our first market. Got two thousand customers on our wait list. We're rolling them on uh, in real time. Uh, we think that's a huge market. That alone is a huge market of about fifteen billion dollars of electricity spend. And then we're kind of targeting a handful of select other states for our next market. So that's that's a summary of what we're up to. All right, fantastic. Let's give uh, Michael a big round of applause. Nicely done. So I've got questions. I am uh, your target. Um, in a way, because I have Teslas mm -hmm. and I have Nest, mm -hmm. and I'm constantly um, debating with myself because, like you said, you with an electric vehicle, if you're only going to charge it for a couple of hours a night, you can kind of set it already in the Tesla. Right. So I can set it, and I have them all set to do it at 1 a.m. because mm -hmm. I... Don't know this, but I'm pretty sure it drops down, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter to me anyway because I only need to charge them for five hours a night or so. Plug mm -hmm. them in, boom. But then I realize it's probably not that big of a difference. We're probably saving a dollar or two a day, a month or something. So it's mm. probably. You'd be surprised how much yeah. electricity do those things stuck but up. I yep. don't know is the yep. key. Exactly. And it adds up. And then exactly. washers and dryers, same thing. Yep. It would be very cool if there was a standard that said, just. Why is there no standard that just tells you what the energy price is in real time? Mm -hmm. Like on your phone or yeah. on yeah. a network device in your house somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So our whole thing is that not only do we want to provide that transparency, but we want to provide control yeah. and then feedback. Because it's one thing for people to do manual actions. It's another thing for that to be automated. Mm -hmm. And so the way – I didn't even get to the way that we well, structure it. But back to my original mm -hmm. question. Why is there no – or is the, does this exist yet in the market? Just a way for me to know what the cost is right now. Or do I have to look it up you, on the you website? You can look up a bunch of spreadsheets and hopefully figure it out. I think, unfortunately- In what, in retrospect? Yeah. Uh, or in real time? So again, there's two markets here. There is regulated and unregulated. Got it. So our focus first is deregulated markets. That's when Got people it. get to California, choose- California, one of those? Unfortunately, not yet. Got it. Uh, so California, you can choose here in San Francisco, we can choose between PG&E and then what's called a CCA. But outside of California- what does that mean, CCA? Uh, community Choice Aggregator. So that's Got a it. city kind of developing its own municipal system, right? Is all this solved by nuclear? I hate to get big picture. Uh, on you. So the answer on nuclear is that we have not, a, we don't have a very good track record on it. We're trying to build nuclear plants right now, and yeah. we are billions of dollars over budget. And well, we're even just, yeah, they're stalling them. But I mean, even nuclear would solve all of this. Well, it? even existing nuclear plants in places like Ohio, New Jersey, yeah. are not as the the average per megawatt hour cost mm -hmm. to produce electricity is about twice as much as renewable energy. Huh. So they are they are actually closing down right now because they can't compete yeah. with new renewable energy being built. It is amazing. The new solar panels, building a new solar panel cheaper than building a coal plant for the first time, right? It, it's actually cheaper in a lot of markets to build a brand new coal and wind project than it is to operate currently existing coal plants. So, so wow. As so an example, Northern Indiana, middle of coal country, is decommissioning halfway used coal assets because it's cheaper for them to just decommission those and move to brand new wind and solar that are yet to be built than to keep using that existing asset. So we should feel good about yeah. what's happening in the free market wind and solar, with electricity. Are wind you telling and... me the free market yes. has figured this out? So there are not many industries where the... Uh, cost of the product has declined by 90 or 95 percent in the course of five or ten years that is renewable energy so now renewable energy is no longer what drove that uh was well, that government intervention it was mostly on the solar side driven because it's made out of silicon so advances oh. in silicon wafers so have technology and entrepreneurship did technology it? cost curves i'm shocked and wait you're saying it wasn't a government mechanisms. official in a job for two years <laughs> who didn't solve this problem you know that's actually part of the uh stigma that we're all trying to fight right now is that actually renewable energy is just the lowest cost source of energy almost anywhere people don't understand this not yet we have won we've not already yet. won so anybody talking about putting in coal plants has lost their goddamn mind. Am unless I right it, or wrong? Unless if they like to pay a premium for their electricity. Right. So we're literally putting in, pol anybody arguing for coal today in 2019, mm -hmm. you're confirming with me, mm -hmm. Michael, with your knowledge from EvolveEnergy.com, everybody go check that out, available in Texas this year. Um, it'll be available this year? Or sign up now? Pretty much right now. Pretty much right now. Okay, go to Evolve Energy. If you're in Texas, you know somebody, email them, EvolveEnergy.com. Anybody arguing for coal right now is arguing for more expense and more pollution mm -hmm. and shorter lifespans. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. So all this hand-wringing, all of this debate was solved, in fact, 
by entrepreneurs and innovation like you. Mm -hmm. Because if you can connect the washer and dryer to the smart grid and tell people, uh, not, not a good time to put on your electric dryer, which is the biggest culprit in the house, correct? Depends or the refrigerator? On the house. Air conditioning actually usually oh, is for air places. Conditioning is, yeah. But here in San Francisco, we don't use air conditioning. Yeah, exactly. So it would be air conditioning in Texas. Yep. In San Francisco, it's Could the washer hot. dryer or the refrigerator? Washer dryer, all the appliances, hot water heater, and in your case, the hot electric water. vehicle. The electric vehicle. Those are the big culprits. It should be mandatory that your software be included in all these washers and dryers. And the washers and dryers should just automatically, but you're creating the API layer that will put all this together, the glue. Exactly. You're like the Zapier or if this, then that. You're going to glue all this stuff together. So not only that, but we're the electricity company that doesn't make any money on electricity. So our whole yeah. product is we pass through electricity from the wholesale power price at cost. And we charge, call it $10 to start, more for additional services. $10 oh, you're going to be month. a subscription. So we're purely a subscription model. And huh. so that's nearly 100% gross margin for us. We are 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month? Call it 10 bucks a month. And we so are 60 million, 70 million homes in the US is the addressable market mm -hmm. or something like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. And that's just the US. That's just the US. And this is very much an, an opportunity for EU, Australia, many markets today. Is there a standard for communicating between IoT devices and the grid yet? Is there an open source standard like there's HTML or, you know, the Wikipedia has like its own open source kind of philosophy around data? In a way, that's kind of what we're providing. Yeah, I was about we're, to say, we're if that you, middle you layer. could lead yeah. an open source movement in addition to your company, mm -hmm. an open source movement to just say, here's how um, to tell, here's a protocol yes. to tell appliances, yes. you know, high, medium, low, or just a number. And then here is a protocol and a standard to set your numbers. Yep. Because they have eco settings on um, the the Nest, mm -hmm. which has been a godsend. Because if you've got the uh, war going on in your house uh, over the thermostat, you can say, well, what's the ma what's the hottest you can take? 74? Great. Mm -hmm. What's the coldest you can take? 60? Great. We'll put it at 60, 74. Anything in between there, we don't turn on the stuff. Mm -hmm. Of course, some people, and I'm not going to mention names, like to pick a very specific degree mm -hmm. as opposed to putting a sweater on. I'm turning into a dad <laughs> where I'm like, close the door, wear well, a sweater. With phones, we can tell who's in the house and what their definition of comfort is. And so we can actually exactly. pre-cool the house, do some dynamic Man. stuff ahead of time. If this works, what's next? If you can make this basic, yeah. you know, uh, you know, washer dryer so stuff you, work, is there another card you're gonna un uncover here? So you mentioned the open API system and that's definitely something we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we're actually generating here is actually a really unique proprietary data set. We know exactly who's sensitive to what things yeah. and at what time. And so Perfect. once we do that, then kind of sky's the limit. So yeah. what about uh, batteries? Putting a power wall in is going to solve a lot of these problems? Um, I like to say they so are, if you can't control it, then battery's great. So let's for, put, for example, your uh, your electric vehicle. We yeah. could put an electric vehicle between your car or a battery between your electric vehicle and the grid right. and then just never think about it. Or we could just use software instead of paying $20,000 for a battery and yeah. just use software to dynamically manage when it's charging. So yeah. it'll always be cheaper to dynamically manage with software, but say your television, you're not gonna wanna watch Game of Thrones at two in the morning just because it's cheaper then. Right. So things that are inflexible, that's when a battery becomes really uh, yeah. helpful. All for right, it. well done. Big round of applause for Michael. Awesome. Nicely done. All right, Stolian Baptiste is with us back on the pod. Is this the third time we've done this? Second, third? Third. Third time. Thank yeah. you for doing this. Always great Thank, companies. Thank you for having us. Always great to have your feedback. Um, I really like this cohort. Th did you have five or was there like, this is like a highlight of five of 10 or? Uh, this is five of seven. Five of seven. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll meet the other two uh, by email and uh, we'll see if we can meet them. Food for all. Um, great idea. I met David a year ago. He was a little too early for us, but now you're starting to see some traction here. Yeah. Um, and this is a great one because- we're not just taking the food and like doing a, a B corporation, you know, oh, we have to feed the poor kind of situation. Um, it's more like a free market solution, right. which means it could be sustainable because all these nonprofits that were running food from food banks and whatever, it because it wasn't a free market solution, there's probably a stigma with bringing the food to a food bank. You liabilities. To, liabilities. Yeah. You have to run the food. Oh, my God. There's so many. Yeah. Not that those people didn't have good intent, but I think we see this over and over again, and I hate to be a free market monster here, but 
the free market opportunity for that restaurant to sell at half price and get something, which would have been a zero, right. and for a consumer to eat with dignity, perhaps a little bit less. If you come in for the two for one, maybe you feel a little stigmatized, but I would actually do this and I used to do it. You know, I don't have any problem with going, if I get a discount going in late, because I eat late anyway. Right. Uh, what do you think of this company? What's their biggest challenge? What are your thoughts on it? What was your, why, did you, why did you accept it and what's the biggest challenge? I guess that's a good way to frame it. I uh, We were and remain excited about Food for All's um, very high ratings and feedback from their users. Mm. Um, Not so, the restaurants, the users. They well, like it. Yeah, and that that's the leading indicator, right? Mm. Because ultimately you can win restaurants by showing that you have a very passionate user base mm. that will try your food just because you're on our app. Right. Um, We're going to drive people. You're going to drive you're going to drive business to these restaurants. So there's an additional value proposition that they get to offer at scale. Uh, so the challenge is going to be maintaining that high fidelity, um, high quality of feedback and touch with the users. Half price, pretty good way. Half price for the same thing an hour yeah. later, pretty good way to get high MPS. Well, granted, you can certainly buy love, uh, we know, but yeah. keeping that love users are very judgmental they're and so and they're spoiled right they yeah. they they want very smooth ux beautiful ui yeah. um they want an experience that doesn't leave them with food sickness in the in in this yeah. instance um so you have to give food for all credit where it's due which yeah. is they've been able to retain very high um love uh from their users amazing uh okay uh pilot P-I-L-I-T. This was a fascinating one, the uh, Sel Sullivan uh, family. Yeah. When you first saw this one, what did you think? Uh, well, there were, there's a lot of minefields around um, uh, what they're, what the company that they're building. Um, but there's what, also- What is the primary minefield? Well, primary minefield is it's hardware um, oh, yeah. and they're selling the government. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, degree of difficulty just went way up. Yeah, this is one of those instances as an investor you'll appreciate. You just have your rules. I'll never invest in this thing or these combinations of things. Government or hardware? Well, for me, we, we invest in hardware. We invest government. But I'm like, we're never going to invest in both at the same time. Put in we, some music licensing and let's make it maybe some yeah, medical records. Right. Let's see if we can increase the degree of difficulty here. So as you know, rules are meant to be broken. Yep. You say you'll never do something as an investor and then you find a yeah. great opportunity. You do it. Um, we... We also, I think, tend to do things that other investors might not want to do. Um, that's where you find alpha. Uh, and so a family business, uh, hardware, government, like there's a lot of investors that would not even take a meeting on those bases alone. But then you look behind that and you see that they've built a solid business with revenue. They're mm. coded into law. So there's something about their business development skills that are above par. Um, and they're, what they're doing is necessary. It's it's underappreciated, underserved, but it's necessary. We're above the seventy year mark on uh, yeah. a lot of our infrastructure, and you don't you don't deploy a trillion dollars, uh, you know, happen happenstance and just throw it everywhere. You have to figure out where to target that investment, and they're the leading indicator on mm -hmm. where to where to invest that money. Interesting, and yeah, people like us are looking for alpha, and our job is to believe in people that maybe the later stage investors do not yet believe in, right? And figure out how to make it palatable for those later stage investment investors for it to meet their criteria, which is why I said, hey, double, why not triple? Right. What did you think of that feedback? A little too harsh or accurate? Accurate. I mean, at the core of our um, value add, I, I believe, for, for Pilot has been how to frame what they're doing um, to be the large story that it, that it really is. And they're, they're light years ahead of, of where they were uh, just half a year ago. Yeah. But there's still always work to be done. You're the master of crafting a story and um, mm. really pitching a narrative around a company's potential. And so, yeah, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the opportunity uh, it, it is hard to state in a believable way, which there's a conservativeness, I suppose, to, to the way that it's currently being pitched yeah. because it's a business with real legs, yeah. right? And so it's, it, you know, when you're a, a pitcher with just an idea and it's yeah. charisma, you, you know, you sell the say moon, anything, yeah. you say anything, but when you've got real revenue, you've got real customers who might be watching, you don't want to over promise. And so there's a, there's a sort of walking a fine line there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we're kind of, feels like we're moving into a different phase in Silicon Valley, doesn't it? Yeah. Where real revenue is more appreciated than right. maybe hyper growth, but maybe the revenue and the unit economics are broken. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we you can't get away from the need for hyper growth with venture. I mean, we're taking really early risky bets. We need that growth mm -hmm. to be able to um, get the ROI for ah. our investors or for our, for in your sure. case, for our personal needs. Yeah. Um, and so now that I just think the job has gotten harder for entrepreneurs. Frankly, yeah. the rules have changed to I need you to to you have to have revenue and fast growth and and margin. And it so, keeps going up. Yeah. The, the the benchmark to clear market continues. Yeah. The bar continues to rise. Right. And I think founders are looking at who got funded 10 years ago, five years ago, and even two years ago. And they're waking up to the reality that that is not who get, will get funded in the next year. It's changed. Right. Uh, okay. Hubster, we happen to have something in this space. Really clever idea. But from another country, how do you think about an international investment like that? Yeah, I mean, we you probably have noticed a pattern uh, with the companies that we bring to you, which is there's always a good, healthy mix of international founders. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, again, part of our secret sauce is playing that arbitrage, finding underappreciated opportunities overseas, um, opening up the U.S. markets for them, including U.S. investors. Mm. Um, it is predicated on the company at least strongly considering becoming a U.S. entity. Um, a lot of the risks related to uh, investing internationally, well, there are two main risks really, which is can you help them in the, in the market that they're selling to? Uh, and if you're not in you know, uh, Denmark, you're, you're not going to be able to help them find customers in Denmark. So can, can you convince them to find customers in, in your backyard? And two, can you help them raise money? You're probably, they're probably not going to get anywhere with Denmark investors. So can you convince them to do their roadshow? No uh, offense to the investors in Denmark, but you got to start writing some checks, people. Stop sitting right. on that capital. Yeah. No, they're I, also conservative in Europe. Honestly, it's like they're so scared right. of placing a bet. And there is no this week in startups with Jason to give feedback and sort of a this this show is sort of a launching point into the tech or, ecosystem or, and fundraising. Yeah. So to have or a, Urban X to yeah. take you for twelve weeks, right? They need to build up that infrastructure. No you infrastructure. do see it in in Stockholm, in Sweden, Norway, Denmark. But I mean, a but bit, there's yeah. a power law still to um, specifically the Bay Area more broadly. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. the, the competitor. Where that dynamic is shifting is really Asia, is the China markets, yeah. and that those dollars are fo focused inward, mm. um, and so you can't go from Europe to China to raise, uh, but no. you could still come to the U.S. and we're still the leader. Yeah, yeah, and and we will continue to be, because founders here are still aspirational. They right. still want to build global businesses. Yeah, and you can what still I, fail here. Yeah, and get up and get increase the chances you get funded. Exactly, as opposed <laughs> to Europe, where if you fail. That's it. One right. and done, I think. Right. Here, it's like, oh, tell me about your first two failures. Great. What's next? Right. Let's do the next one. You failed before? Awesome. Permission to go again. 3, a, uh, 3 a.m. Loved it. Obviously, I'm a yeah. captured audience here with my brother being a firefighter. My brother's a firefighter, too. All right. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, you live with that, right? You live with that fear of yeah. that phone call or you know somebody could disappear. And this is um, a really niche thing, but so important. And you think about the wildfires alone, right. sadly, this is going to become the new norm or on a global basis with global warming. Right. Um, and so we're going to need more and more of these. Right. And I could see these also eventually coming down and maybe having a second life. I was thinking about it. I was like, I wonder if there's a personal use for this, hiking, you know, skiers, Absolutely. carry the avalanche GPS kind of stuff. Yeah. And you start thinking about these mesh networks. There was always this promise of the mesh networks, but it never worked. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that? Like yeah. five, six, seven years ago, we got pitched on a lot of mesh network right. stuff. It never worked. Well, so why it, is it working now? It's not that it never worked. It's that the focus uh, was broadly on creating these networks that we would eventually find a use case for. Hmm. And so um, that was phase one. We need mesh networks. Nobody knew why. Phase two was we need sensors and IoT everywhere, but still there was no why. Right. And so you have um, use specific use cases like Pilot, like 3AM, where it's like uh, we need to save lives. That's why we need the mesh networks. Right. And so, you, again, that's something you'll probably notice from our uh, our portfolio. We're not chasing a technology stack. We're chasing a problem to solve uh, mm. a stakeholder to serve. Well, I was about to ask that. Did you say, hey, let's look for mesh network no. technology companies that are solving a problem. You just happen to stumble upon two in one cohort. Exactly, yeah. But now that you stumble on two, 
you have some dexterity, you understand what a mesh network is, which means if these work and they get traction, now you start thinking, well, maybe mesh networks is a, a why now for our industry. Sure, sure. I mean, we um, pride ourselves in, I mean, we have a phenomenal engineering team, so we can respond to any, it could have been network, mesh networks, it could have been gra graphite material advancement, yeah. right? We, we like to stay responsive to whatever is next yeah. in technology. We, we will never start a mesh network fund. No, um, having the funds is so dumb because by the right. time you can identify the trend, it's basically you miss the it's opportunity. Too it's too yeah. late. Like, I have an on-demand fund. It's like, right. really? Whereas, to your point, fires, um, natural disasters, are it's it's not too late. We're probably at the beginning of a really yeah. um, big uh, problem slash opportunity. Yeah. And so um, you, you introduced us earlier as an urban-focused fund. We, ha we are and have always been actually a climate change-focused fund. Yeah. Cities are just a concentrated market where you mm. can get things out into the world. That's why we're urban-focused. But mm. this is the beginning of a, of a trend around yeah. natural disasters. Resilience is a very big part of that, hence... Uh, it's 3 a.m. It's amazing where we are in society, I think, that we're looking at what used to be deaths that we just accepted. Okay, certain number of people die in cars, certain number of people die in fire, certain number of people die drowning, certain number of people die, you know, construction accidents, getting sure. hit on the side of the road while they're working. And now we're like, well, wait a second, why? Why, why can't we solve those 800? Why can't we solve those 1,200? Why can't we solve those 30,000? Like, right. And it sounds silly, but you know, whatever number of people, we always use uh, bee stings as like, how many people die from, why haven't we solved that? Like, why are people still dying from bee stings? Or, mm. you know, uh, and people make fun of, I think it's very easy to be cynical, right? Yeah. Oh, you're using lasers to kill mosquitoes inside the house. Like, remember that one? Yeah. And I was like, wait a second, a laser is becoming really cheap. A laser at that level can't hurt a human. And with computer vision, if it sees the mosquito and points a laser at it and shoots it, and somebody doesn't get malaria, and that thing costs 50 bucks, and malaria vaccines or shots or whatever costs 1000 we might be saving money. Right. And our job, you quickly, it's one of the great things I love about being an investor is you don't have to be cynical. Mm. In fact, cynicism is death for an investor. If you're cynical, you're at cynical at your peril. Right. Because it's the person who tries the 17th time to figure this shit out who winds up hitting the big mother load Right. It's like people were drilling for oil, 16 rigs got zero, and then the 17th one's the one that struck oil. Right. And you were like, well, you know what? I, I tried twice. No oil here. Mm. All right. Speaking of energy, Evolve Energy, another interesting one. I'm in that wheelhouse. Yeah. Do you worry about one like that going into a regulated space like that with consumer adoption, with technology risk? I was thinking, again, about all the hurdles that yeah. have to be solved. And I was thinking for that founder, Michael, like, hmm, Wow. A lot of hurdles here, right? So, is it the, ready? Is the way we think about regulated industries is we're we're investing at pre-seed, along the lines of when you invest, right? So, super early, there aren't a lot of resources to go help rewrite policy or hire lobbyists. So, we'll never invest in something where we think that for this to work, regulations have to go in your favor. Um, this is one of those instances where it is in a regulated industry, but the but the field is already wide enough. Between the four or five states, they already have access to yeah. deregulated energy markets. It's not a question of whether this is going to be big. It's a question of how big. If more markets open up, then it's a difference between them being a $10 billion versus a $100 billion yeah. company. For us, um, both of those are fantastic outcomes. Okay. Now, you can't pick your favorite. No. But I can pick my favorite. Yep. And uh, going through these... I always think about which one I think has the clearest path to 100 million. And I'm just going to go through that as an exercise. Evolve Energy, $10 a month, 100 million, 10 million, uh, a million subscribers, $100 a year. Yeah. Seems possible. That would be one out of 60 million homes. They need to have a market penetration of roughly 2%. Right. Possible. Uh, it doesn't seem impossible. Uh, Patrick O'Connor, $600 a firefighter. Right, fifty bucks a month, mm -hmm. six hundred a year per firefighter. A million firefighters would be six hundred, so a hundred thousand would be sixty million. So it's like a hundred and two, maybe a hundred fifty or something like that. Hundred fifty thousand firefighters seems pretty easy, actually. If it becomes the standard, it might be a straight path to that. Right. Have you done this, by the way? Have you done this math? The math, yeah. We this do exercise? this as part of our diligence. Yeah. Oh, you do the hundred million dollar question? Yeah. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Somebody's taking notes. Okay. Um, 
Hubster, same thing. $10 a month subscription, $20 a month of subscription if you did that. Okay, $100 a year, million subscribers. Com's got $2 million. Fitbod's got 150000 Getting $2 million subscribers, not so difficult. Uh, listen, the Selvin family is already at $2 million, but they're only doubling a year. But if they were tripling, two, six, eighteen, then maybe you go to the doubling territory. You get to 30, maybe then you're growing 50%. Seems like they have a very clear path and they have the most revenue of everybody, correct? Right. Yep. And then you have food for all. Wow, this could become a trend. This could be like millennials. They like to save money, right? Yeah. They're, that's their whole thing. And they're at 30K a month, 7,000 a month. Or, yeah, so they're at 100,000. They'd have to 10X to a million, 10X to 10, 10X again. So they got a little ways to go. I think that 3AM and Pitlet are direct paths to 100 million. It's between those two for me in terms of the clearest path to 100 million. And it's a hard decision for me. I do have three runners up okay. that I would like to applaud. Food for All, Hubster, and Evolve Energy. Those yep. are my three runners up. Okay. Yes. But for my number one and my number two. Hmm. God, two million. It's a lot of revenue. But boy, at 3 a.m., that's a clear path, too. People are willing to pay a lot of money for keeping those firefighters safe. Save one life. It's talking about $10, $20 million. I mean, just aside from the tragedy of a life loss, but the, those lives are, there's a dollar cost associated with those lives that could be quantified by those unions and those uh, firefighters. Mm. Insurance companies. Insurance company, everybody yeah. kind of, yeah. But then you think about that crumbling infrastructure, right? And so this is where it gets very hard. This is why we don't place one bet as a founder, as investors. Right. We place multiple bets. You got you got action in all five. I have action in none. I have zero exposure. I need to get not some yet. Exposure. Not yet. I need to get some exposure here. Uh, get a little slice of the pie. A little get my beak wet. Um, but I have to go with the one that has the most revenue right now. So I'm going to pick the Sullivan family. Who's that? Who's that young Turk you got here? Who's that young uh, whip? That whippersnapper, Jim. Yeah. How old are you, Jim? Old so, enough to, old oh, you can tell me. I'm 48. How old are you? Old enough to know that. 70 I'm yet? You're 65, 70. What are you? A little older? You could say. You might be the record for the oldest founder on the show. What? How old are you? 71. 71. Yeah. Look how young he is. Look at the energy. This is what entrepreneurship's about. Yep. You you look like you got more energy than all these other whippersnappers. Well, more importantly, Jim doesn't have to be up here. He doesn't have to be doing this. He was a successful yeah. uh, medical professional, really? before this, and he's in the game. He's in the he game. He wants to win. You can yeah. see the energy. He can't wait to get back to the office. Yeah. I love it. This is what entrepreneurship does. Keeps you young. Yep. So uh, that's my number one. Is that young Turk, seventy-one year old, young? And this is uh, we have a lot of bias against age in this industry. Let me tell you something. It's a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of wisdom in people who've lived a life. And if they come into entrepreneurship at 35, 45, 55, 65, it turns out the number, the the returns are better for that group. There are outliers in young people, but sure. it turns out overall, the, for, the sweet spot's in the 40s, according to some of the recent statistics. I think we're leaving a lot of uh, entrepreneurial talent in the 60s and 70s. Yep. If you're 60 or 70, you want to start a business, go freaking do it. Don't wait. But you got to get your kids involved too, because there might be some heavy lifting. Cheap and then labor. number two for me is three a.m. And I'll just do the other three. Really great job. You're going to make a lot of money, Stoney. Uh, well, although I'm, I noticed that you're uh, you're you're doing a little bit of vacation on your Instagram. You are on a boat. What's going on with the boat life? Uh, it was a nice week away in Turkey with uh, ah. with my now fiance. Uh, Congratulations! So, yeah, Wait, when did you get engaged? You. Uh, and on the boat after the as one does yeah as one does boat life yeah you actually interviewed her on this show oh really uh five years ago what was her name and what's her uh, tamar Come tamar lucien she was running uh can you start back then that oh, cool. startup failed she's now ceo of, an, of, of a new startup uh mental happy which just graduated from yc oh great yeah and they're trying to help people with mental mental health yeah yeah which is big yeah You've, I mean, you've had success in that space yourself. With Calm, yeah. yeah. It's done, mm -hmm. That's my second biggest. Yeah. How many unicorns uh, six are you now? Six that, are that, that you can talk about. Six How many known. that, you, including the ones you can't talk about? Well, I think there's, you know, listen, we have a little unicorn uh, deflation going on at the moment. Sure. Mm -hmm. So who knows with these things? But I do think at a, there's probably another half dozen that are, you know, somewhere in 
you know, Sunicorn territory. Sunicorn. <laughs> Sunicorn. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they then, might get there. And you recently wrote about pe Pegasi. Yeah, the Pegasus movement is really interesting. Yeah. Like, if you think about these companies, you know, they're all going to raise money in all likelihood. Sure. But let's say the flywheel gets going for um, uh, Food for All. There's going to be... Food for All might be thinking, David and his co-founders, you know, success for us is raising $3 million. That's what they might be thinking. Mm -hmm. But it might turn out that the restaurants value what they're doing so much um, that the restaurants give them, and that m m food was going to be thrown away anyway, Right. that they could pay them quarterly for the thrown away food. It's just an idea. They say, listen, we want, we'll let you on the platform. It's, we pay you net 60, six times a year. So you get this nice lump sum every six, every other month. It's a nice, you know, little thing, and they could float that two months. So if they sign up more restaurants, they have more cash to invest in signing up the next restaurant, and the flywheel starts going. Yeah. Just like, Calm is fifty nine dollars a year when billed annually. Right. And if you want to peck around and try to find the monthly pricing, good luck. That's fine. You can, but just pay the sixty bucks and let's get on with it. You don't have to pay the twelve dollars a month. It's a better deal. It's better for everybody. And then that money can go into getting the next group of people, the next group of people. And so what I encourage all founders to do is be creative in that model and all investors to work with your founders on that. Can you skip a round of funding? Because every time a founder dilutes 20%, we get diluted 20% if we don't participate or we got to put more cash in. But there are creative ways to not do that. And Calm went from a $5 million investment, $5 million valuation, the next valuation was two fifty. dollars Fitbod. Wow. You know, we had whatever six or seven million dollar valuation when they graduated. They haven't raised money since. Company's worth a hundred million now, in all likelihood, or ninety or eighty, maybe eighty or ninety. Who knows? You know, we'll see how they keep growing. Yeah. But you know, by the end of the year, probably going to break a hundred, right? So just feel, give yourself permission to not raise money. That is not the goal here. Right. The goal is to have profits. Right. So raise a little bit, and it's noble to skip around to funding for you and your, on behalf of your team. Yeah, we and the have Pegasus a, is that. yeah we have the biggest company in our portfolio, our Sunicorn, uh, never raised more than one round after us, and yeah. uh, now has more revenue. Which they one have, is that? The printing cash can't say. Can't, can't say. Can't say. Yeah. But they're printing cash. Yeah, and, and that's what business is about. Well, just print that cash and put it, right. pay it forward mm -hmm. into your investments. Yeah. You, you know, everybody's. We, one of the things that happened in this cycle, you know, and you can tell these cycles when they get hot, is that the founders get better. They, they understand investors better than they understand their customers. Mm. That's a very dangerous moment in time. When you're, when you're understand, it's great to understand investors, great to understand the investment community and be able to quickly and efficiently raise funds. But when you get so good at it that you are, you know twice as much about investors than your own customers, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Yeah. Know your customer. Yeah. Know your business. Know your unit economics. Everything will also follow. All right, listen, Amen. continued success. Thanks for sending the comp companies here, it's and we'll see you time. all next time on This Week in Startups.